Hi, everybody. Uh, welcome to our session on the Cold War for globalization since 1945. I'm here in my office uh, in this late afternoon. I'll show you the view from my office. Oh, it's so bright. Uh, so um, we're just about to start the seminar. Uh, so I'm just here for a minute uh, to say hello and to say that as promised, um, I've given the introduction already and as promised after class, I'll give a follow up. As I said, I wanted to see how the conversation went led by what uh, students in seminar have to say. Um, and then I'll pick up points from that uh, and try to develop them, maybe make some historiographical connections um, after class. So um, I will invite you to, to join me on, on my walk home after class. I also will be uh, rushing to get out of the building because the class ends um, at 10 to 5 and I have to be out of here. Uh, the building the building closes at 5 with the uh, shorter hours with, with lockdown conditions. So right now it's just about 4 o'clock. So we're just about to start. Um, and so I look forward to seeing you uh, in an hour from now, my time, a split second yours, as I pick up the conversation from seminar uh, after class. Okay, more shortly. Okay, hi everybody, John Monroe here. Uh, I just got out of the building in time. This is the arts building. Um, for those uh, in the uh, distance learning group who haven't been to campus before, I thought this would be a little bit of a chance to just show you the campus. I'm sure you've seen pictures of it, obviously. And maybe you've all been here. But there's the Chamberlain Tower. There's the library. And there's that's this is the Green Heart. And then back around here is the Arts Building. My office is is up there somewhere on the on the top floor. Um, and uh, and I was just in there um, with the with the students who are in the. Um, in person or the Zoom seminar right now, uh, version of the class. And we just had a really excellent fast paced uh, discussion um, that was that was too, too quick for me um, in that the students had so many good things to say um, and, um, and there just wasn't enough time to, to say it all. So now it's left to me to take up the conversation, um, which I will do, and I'll do this after class each time. Um, Essentially, it's like if we think about this, I'll start walking. If we think about this as, um, again, it's kind of weird me just on my own. What would be nice would be if, if you know, us as a collective um, were, you know, going for a walk after class to continue the, the conversation. So that's what I'm going to try to do here as I walk home. And, uh, and I've made a few notes just so that I have a few, a few things to say. But I just want to, um, to pick up. Um, well, I want to say a little bit about the argument to outline that and um, in our conversation for those who were there, you'll know this, that the students in the class and those in the distance learning group, um, you will already have been working this out on your own, but um, we got a really good, um, we kind of worked on developing the argument in class, um, particularly with the, um, with the Human Rights Dictatorship book and, and we got a good sense of that. But I'd still, I still want to kind of run through that a bit. Um, and then uh, hopefully make some historiographical points um, as well, or maybe connect up some of what we're talking about in the reading to, uh, to historiography. And I said this to the students as well already, but I'll say it again, which is um, I also want us all to think about the relationship between the reading each week and um, your dissertation topics. So it might often seem the case that um, the, the, the relationship between them is non-existent or very remote. Um, I still want you to try to, to do that because it, you know, there's sometimes surprising ways that, that the content can actually connect up um, or the content that we're, uh, of something we're reading about in a given week might provide context for something that you're working on. But also, not just in terms of content, but in terms of mode of argumentation. We were talking about this in class too, that there might be a way that a, uh, an argument about a different topic than the one that you're working on um, can, um, can be a way of presenting your argument. And so I'm going to say a little bit about that for the two readings um, that we looked at this week. Um, again, Ned Richardson Little's Human Rights Dictatorship and Thomas Fleischmann's um, essay, uh, Animal Farms, both focused on, of course, uh, the German Democratic, Pup Dem Democratic Republic. Um, 
that country that existed only uh, during during the Cold War. Okay, so let me let me start with um, a little bit on um, the the human rights dictatorship then, and just um, say a few things. So basically, so this is really important again in terms of mode of argumentation. Think about the way that he. Um, sets up the argument, not just the argument that he makes, and I'm going to say something about that, but also to think about the way that he, that he sets it up. And not just setting up the argument, but also thinking about, again, for your own writing, the opening scene. How do you want to set the stage? What's the hook? What's the way in um, that's going to get the reader's attention and, and have them, you know, uh, paying close attention to what you're saying? And also with a, with, a, with a good opening scene, wanting to know what it is that you have to say, wanting to, to read on. And so, of course, with um, the human rights dictatorship, Ned Richardson Little has the, you know, the very ready to hand and wisely chosen example of the fall of the Berlin Wall. What a traumatic story that is. Um, and it's also a story that everybody knows. So not only does that serve the purpose of getting the reader's attention, because it's interesting to think about that moment um, in, in global history, um, but it also is something that we, that we know about. And so we can also kind of follow along in the immediate first few lines being like, yeah, yeah, I know, I know this. I know what this is about. I re-, you know, well, some of us are old enough to remember. Others have read about it. Um, and to think about the meanings of this. That's also very useful as a way of setting up his argument because first he sort of tells that story um, in even just the opening paragraph. And from there, um, he, he then sort of, you know, situates that as actually quite wrong uh, in, in important ways in terms of the way that it's, that it's thought about. So basically the, the received narrative there being that the fall of the Berlin Wall was a victory for human rights. I don't think, you know, most people would find that to be a very controversial statement. Um, and so, so that's, again, it just, okay, there's cars coming, there's very little space for pedestrians. You're going to hear me criticize about being a pedestrian in, in Birmingham on these walks because it's, uh, this is a dangerous city to be a pedestrian in, especially when you have to do social distancing, which of course is important to, to do. I'm not wearing a mask. Um, I am very pro mask, but I can't see my, my glasses will fog right up because it's cold and I won't be able to see where I'm going. So I just will make sure to keep extra social distance. Here comes someone as I go, let me lean over here. And in fact, for those of you who haven't been here, here's a look at the canal and I will take, it's going to be dark soon. So I will not take the canal right now, but, um, but, uh, I'll show you the other side, but I will go that way, uh, in, in a future, uh, week. Maybe not next week, but, but on one of the weeks. I'll try to take a slightly different way home each way um, so that uh, at least that part can be uh, somewhat interesting. Okay, so of course the GDR, the German Democratic Republic, um, is, it was, is known in the received narrative as a place without, without um, human rights. This is why the fall of the Berlin Wall was a victory for, uh, for human rights. Okay, so this is the received, the received story. And so Richardson Little um, establishes this idea quickly because it's easy to establish because it's the received, received version. And he also points out that it's not like there's nothing to it. It's not just a, it's, you know, he's going he's gonna to say that there's something wrong with that idea, but it's not because people are stupid necessarily. That's not the idea. There, there is, um, you know, obviously the Socialist uh, Unity Party, um, the SED, did dominate the political landscape. There, there were not competing parties. It was not a, a pluralist uh, democratic setup. Um, the Stasi, the, the Ministry for State Security, you know, famous, rightly famous um, for spying, for its repression, and for its crackdowns on certain kinds of freedom uh, within the GDR. So, so it's also, if you're, if you're setting up an argument to say, here's a received narrative that I want to, to criticize. You also probably want to give that narrative a bit of its due and acknowledge what it's, you know, what kind of power it has. Why does it have a hold on our understanding of a given set of events? So in this case, I mean, it's also because of other reasons of ideological domination um, of the West during and then, 
expandedly after uh, 1989. But it's also because there is truth to it in that the GDR was indeed um, a place in which certain freedoms were not, uh, were not possible and repression was indeed an everyday experience for its, for its citizens. Okay, but here's the catch. Within the, um, within the GDR, the, the government, the SED, indeed claimed itself to be um, not, just, not just an advocate of human rights, but indeed a leader um, uh, of human rights on the global scene. So this is another way of thinking about um, setting up an argument. Richardson Little really nicely sets up the, you know, what we might call the apparent contradiction um, uh, way of setting up an, um, an argument by saying, okay, these two things seem contradictory. So the interpretation being put forward by this book, by an article, by your master's dissertations is going to unravel that contradiction and show it to be um, to be understandable, explicable, um, and maybe not a contradiction after all. So then we get the sense that human rights within the GDR was, um, was not a contradiction. It was something that in fact uh, was an important part of state discourse. What it did do was shift over time. So this is another really key part of his argument that human rights are not just a thing, an ahistorical thing, um, which were, um, which were absent in the GDR and then became present once uh, the Cold War um, ended, but rather human rights existed within the GDR, a certain kind of human rights, a certain kind of discourse of human rights existed within the GDR, and that shifted uh, over time. So we're now thinking about um, human rights as historical, as, as constructed, as not necessarily a given. This also, as was raised in our conversation in class today, this also is an argument about agency then, because it gives the, um, the citizens of the GDR some agency in their own history in terms of, of human rights. Human rights is not mm, only something that existed outside, that, that GDR citizens had no, no role in, in developing and then simply was introduced, was imported, no. The citizens of the GDR um, were important uh, actors with agency in imbuing this history of, of human rights within this country uh, with, with meaning, or we might say with meanings because they shift over time. Okay, um, so, um, and here we're getting into, so that's, the, that's a, a kind of statement of the overall argument and the main things I think it wants to accomplish. But there also are some implications to this argument that, uh, that Richardson Little puts forward as well. And this speaks a little bit more to, to some of the specifics um, uh, within Cold War historiography. So one is the uh, Helsinki Accords. So for those who don't know, he does say a little bit about it in the book, but as you also might imagine, even if you don't know, there's a pretty well-developed historiography just on this one event alone. It's really important. The Helsinki Accords involved I think with maybe the exception of Albania, who was in a unique position of its own vis-a-vis -vis, um, the Cold War because Enver Hoxha's, um, because of Enver Hoxha's alliance with the People's Republic of China in the context of the Sino-Soviet split meant that Albania was kind of on neither side. Um, Yugoslavia is a little bit, is a little bit unique too, but not, not as unique as, as Albania. Um, so for reasons we'll put aside for the moment. Uh, I don't think Albania was there, but I think pretty much every other country in Europe was there, um, as well as the United States, uh, maybe Canada too. So, um, so basically you can think of it as the main, you know, the two superpowers and, and their main European allies. Okay, so the received narrative about Helsinki is that it does kind of two things. It acknowledges the, the post-World War II borders. Um, so it acknowledges the existence, um, the legitimacy, therefore, of uh, the Eastern Bloc. So, and the territorial gains um, made by the by the Soviet Union after World War II. Um, so this is um, see, this is what I mean. A pedestrian just can't get across the street uh, often uh, without waiting for a long time. There's no. 
crosswalk. Anyways, um, so this is a victory for the for the communist side, and so um, the quid pro quo, I guess, is that the human rights component is is put into this. Okay, I'm just gonna run across because I'm never gonna cross otherwise. Let's hope I can survive. Um, the um, the human rights component in this. Um, is, is on the other side of victory for the West. And again, that narrative relies on an idea that, that human rights are just one thing. Um, and, it, um, and it means that, uh, that, that maybe the, the, the Eastern Bloc powers were willing to, to give this concession in order to get the borders um, recognized. There's more going on at Helsinki, but these are kind of the main, the main issues. And... Um, and so, or maybe it's the case that they, they didn't really understand um, what, um, what the West meant by human rights, or maybe it's the case that, they, that they're, they're just deceived um, as well. Okay, but that relies on a narrative that puts human rights as, again, a thing, a, an ahistorical thing that is simply a tool that the West can, can use. That overlooks um, the main point that Richardson Little is making, which is that... Um, that human rights developed over time, that there's more than one version of human rights on offer during the Cold War, um, and, that, uh, and that these are, are contested things. Okay, so this book then has something to say about a more specific topic, uh, in this case, um, in this case uh, the, the Helsinki Accords. Okay, so another key part of his, his argument um, is that this connects up to a global story. And we need to have a global frame in order to understand GDR history here. Um, and, um, and this is because the GDR wanted to protect its version of, um, of human rights. And we talked about this in class too, that, you know, we spent a little bit of time sketching out um, the, the meanings of human rights on either side of the Cold War divide. So within liberal capitalist democracies, human rights means stuff like, you know, equal protection before the law, um, uh, the, um, the right to vote, the right to worship, and so on. The key, and the right to engage in entrepreneurial activity um, also. The key issue being that these are thought of as rights at a kind of individual level, okay? Um, and so... In the socialist world, the idea of human rights was more one to do with social rights that one could expect vis-a-vis um, uh, -vis the state, okay? So, uh, the right to housing, um, the right to health care, uh, the right um, the women's uh, access to abortions. Um, there are different kinds of uh, economic rights. So no one's going to starve and no one's going to be homeless because these are part of parts of kind of a human rights discourse around what um, citizens of a place like the GDR can can expect. Okay, so so that's a kind of anti-capitalist, I guess, sort of component to to human rights in the in the socialist sense. Um, but also importantly, human rights under socialism, particularly in the GDR, uh, were also um, viewed as anti-fascist. And so what's going on here is that, you know, many of the communists who, who came into power uh, after World War II had fought against fascism. Some of them had been in concentration camps. Um, and, so, um, and so there also is this, you know, really problematic discourse that, um, that was, you know, very heavy-handed and official in the GDR that sort of erased the significance of fascism and, importantly, of the Holocaust, in that uh, the GDR was sort of presented itself as an anti-fascist power, and that wasn't really subject to question. So uh, this meant that, um, that the GDR didn't really grapple with its, with its Nazi past other than to, to be anti-fascist, you know, by proclamation, and and to, to claim itself and, you know, rightly do, in, in the sense of, of, you know, some of the leaders had been key anti-fascists themselves uh, before 1945. The West couldn't say the same thing because actually, um, you know, 
numerous Nazis were able to, to find their way into power, or mo more, a higher number of Nazis were able to find their way into power uh, in the West. So, um, obviously, West Germany, you know, considered itself to be a non-fascist power, but it didn't have that kind of strident anti-fascist discourse um, as well. So this meant that socialist human rights and the GDR was also about a kind of opposition to fascism and about the communist government of the GDR in friendship with the Soviet Union, protecting uh, the citizens of the GDR from the still operating fascist forces in the, in the West across the, the divide. So anti-capitalist, anti-fascist, and anti-colonial. This is another key um, aspect here of, of socialist human rights. So what I mean here is that um, this comes out of longer communist thinking about imperialism and the relationship between imperialism and capitalism. Lenin, uh, Vladimir Lenin, you know, theorized um, imperialism as a stage of capitalism. Um, and theorized finance capital as a particularly important sort of um, uh, motor in the, the creation and particularly expansion of imperialism. So as, as markets, as capitalist markets are glutted with overproduction and capital um, is being reinvested, uh, capitalists are looking for, you know, access to, um, to cheap resources. They're looking for markets to sell their goods. This leads to expanded markets and expanded territories and imperialism. Okay. Um, in, in Lenin's time, and he's writing about this during World War I, this is particularly urgent because he's theorizing World War I as an imperialist, as an inter-imperialist conflict. What this means is, is that socialists then position themselves as um, anti-imperialists as part of their anti-capitalism because of the link between imperialism and capitalism that they, that they see. So this also means that socialist human rights then have an anti-imperialist kind of component. And this is very important. It connects the GDR story to the global story because it, it means that this anti-colonialism is, is, you know, um, is, is, is being developed and being, and being defended in the GDR um, as global decolonization, as formal global decolonization is taking place um, across the global south. You know, and beginning very shortly after World War II ends, the Philippines becomes independent in 1946 from the United States. Um, even more, uh, you know, noteworthy, I guess, um, India and Pakistan become independent uh, from Britain in 1947. Um, Ghana, an important um, country in terms of African decolonization, becomes independent from Britain in 1957. We can see, um, you know, conflicts, conflicts that are sometimes thought about in Cold War terms, like the uh, U.S. war in Vietnam, as an example of decolonization. Um, the, the Vietnamese uh, communist and nationalist forces led by Ho Chi Minh defeat the French. Um, uh, at Dian Bien Phu, but more generally, uh, you know, in the country in 1954, uh, the U.S. you know takes over from there. They were already they were already involved as as advisors and suppliers uh, of the French. But we can see that this story of decolonization is a very important one, and it's not a sideshow to the Cold War. It is you know um, it is entangled with the Cold War in many ways. In fact, actually. The Cold War, we might think of, is um, not not as significant as it's on it in its own logic, but rather we might think of it as a continuation and an example of the um, the colonial experience uh, in terms of the the global north uh, versus the uh, or vis a vis the global south in this longer historical trajectory. So, socialist human rights in the GDR then can only be really fully understood with reference to this global picture. Um, and uh, so we need to keep this in mind um, as we're working our way, thank you, as we're working our way through this book uh, as well. Okay, so what else do I wanna say about this book? Um, so basically it's a state discourse um, and, and a certain kind of, you know, a, a version of, this is the key thing. A version of human rights is is defended and and developed 
uh, in um, you know, political discourse in the GDR. And it's a state discourse, and it's not really a discourse of dissent. It's a discourse of legitimation for the, um, for the regime. So, um, but over time, it develops and it becomes uh, more of a discourse of dissent as, as time passes. Um, so, let's see here. So what this means then is that uh, 1989 is not a triumph for human rights, um, but more a kind of uh, a breakdown, a shattering of the consensus um, around dissenting ideas of human rights that begin to grow in the 1980s. Um, so, so again, this is just an important um, you know, correction. I guess you could put it this way. Richardson Little uh, corrects um, a received narrative, and it's not just for the sake of correcting it, oh, this is wrong, let me give a more accurate picture, but rather, by doing so, there are many things that we're able to see. We're able to see human rights as multiple, as historical. We're also able to see a whole kind of um, uh, articulation of human rights that, that seems maybe more um, unfamiliar. Uh, for um, for those of us um, you know in the in the Western um, capitalist world, which of course since 1989 or 1991 is is more or less uh, or most of the whole world. Okay, so um, this shared language then um, among dissidents, um, you know, became stronger in the 1980s, and that shouldn't surprise us because of course there was more call for reform across the, um, the communist world, um, unlike in the GDR, in the Soviet Union itself, this was happening more from the top. Mikhail Gorbachev becomes the General Secretary of the Communist Party of the Soviet Union in 1985 or 86, um, uh, in the mid-80s, and, um, and of course his ideas of uh, glasnost and perestroika are, are significant in reforming um, both political expression and and the structure of the economy within the within the Soviet Union. Of course, it's not the reform isn't enough to save the Soviet Union ultimately, but it's really uh, it's really crucial in terms of the the changed landscape of politics within the Eastern Bloc and the communist world in the 1980s. So, in the GDR, then dissenters um, from environmentalist um, uh, you know organizations. Um, from churches, from the peace movement, those worried about, you know, um, atomic warfare, which is always a looming threat, of course. Um, so these dissidents, you know, they come from multiple places. Um, they come from multiple politics, and they have different ideas about the kinds of reform that they want to see. They all use human rights. So do state actors within the GDR bureaucracy, which is, which is very rigid. Um, earlier under uh, Walter Ubricht and then later under Eric Honecker, um, you know, these are very Stalinist leaders um, who, are, who are leading very, uh, you know, inflexible and rigid bureaucracies. Um, but reformers within, there are increasingly, especially in the 1980s, reformers who, um, who see the, the need for things to change because the system is increasingly you know, just not responsive to the kinds of, of demands, we might even say requests, that, that its citizens are putting forward. So, um, and these also include things like immigration, people who want to, to move to the West and they're, and they're not allowed to, to, or even just visit to, to see, you know, to reunite with family members um, and so on. Okay, but not all of these dissenters feel that, you know, they're not just simply thinking, we want the kind of human rights that, the, that exist in the West. Some of them want a more, um, you know, a more pluralist kind of socialism. Um, and that's what they're, what they're aiming for. So what the fall of the Berlin Wall does is it opens up this conversation in terms of this shared language that holds together all these different kind of forces that are, that are advocating for reform in different ways um, are uh, are, are at, a, at a, a spot at which 
you know, certain kinds of visions of human rights that might have elements of socialism as well as elements of liberal democracy become harder and harder to, to sustain. So some of the, of the dissenters then become uh, marginalized in this process. Okay, so Richardson Little then uncovers this more complex story um, and enables us to see um, human rights as part of kind of negotiation, protest, dissent, not just simply, you know, a tool used in a revolution against communism uh, in, in 1989. Okay, so I could say a word about um, the, you know, then he, he proceeds through the different chapters um, obviously, in which he's looking at, you know, well, I'll just, I'll just sum this up by saying um, he looks at the development of, um, of socialist human rights over time in the GDR. He looks at it, you know, shifting from a state discourse to a, um, to a discourse of dissent, particularly by the 1980s, and surprisingly kind of late uh, in, its, in its, you know, kind of um, acceleration as a, as a discourse of dissent. This is a really dangerous crossing. Okay, I gotta run in front of these cars. Okay, look at this. I have to cross here. This is, uh, this um, junction is uh, something we could maybe connect to the history of the Cold War in that the individualism of people with uh, cars and their right to get around by having them uh, supersedes uh, the rights of people to cross the street. But I just, I, I, uh, uh, I'm getting off topic. Okay, so, um, so what I want to say is uh, exactly, he traces this evolution um, over time uh, and then looks at, you know, ultimately leaving us in a place where we can think about, um, where we can think about human rights as multiple um, and to think about, you know, someone brought this up in class, to think about what was, what was interesting, what was, um, what was even maybe worth holding on to about social, uh, socialist human rights. And then therefore thinking about what was lost um, in the story of the, of the fall of the Berlin Wall and the end of the, of the socialist system. Now, you can hold that position um, without saying, you know, without overlooking the very obvious kinds of unfreedom and repression um, that, that so characterized uh, the, you know, ah, the, the, the really existing uh, socialist societies. But, um, but what Richardson Little's book does is it allows us, you know, a much more complicated kind of view on this um, while connecting up to some other important issues as well. Okay, let me take a break for a minute um, and, uh, and say a few things about the historiographical context. I'll speak briefly about that uh, in just a minute. Okay. Okay, hi everyone, back again. Um, I just wanted to get across that road there before I continued. So to speak a little bit about the um, historiography then with um, human rights dictatorship, let me just say, um, well, just a couple of things. So, um, Adarni Westad's uh, Global Cold War was mentioned in class, and, um, and that's a really important book. I would say if there was, you know, another, like, single book that you needed to read to help to make sense of this one, it might be, it might be that one. Um, so it comes out in 2005, and, um, and what that book does is, you know, of course, historians obviously understood already that the Cold War was a global conflict, but they tended to, um, well, in the, in the, um, in the U.S. Uh, foreign relations literature, there was sometimes um, a tendency to look just from the perspective of the United States. Sometimes that made sense because that was the topic of inquiry. Um, or sometimes, you know, from the Soviet perspective, or sometimes at the two together. What Richardson, um, I mean, what uh, Adarni Westad does is he fully, he looks at the conflict in a fully globalized sense. The, the title really, um, he really delivers on the title in that book. But another really uh, important thing that that book does um, connects to something I was saying before, 
is he also kind of triangulates the relationship of the Cold War by saying that, by, by setting it up as kind of a three-sided conflict rather than the two-sided conflict that we might already expect. So, um, as he calls it, the, the empire of, I think he calls it the empire of liberty, the United States, the empire of justice, the Soviet Union, and the revolutionaries, the global south. So he puts the, um, the decolonization story and the Cold War story very much into, into conversation with one another. And what this has the effect of doing, he doesn't always say this explicitly, but he, he sometimes does, is that this essentially means that the Cold War is itself a kind of example, uh, a continuation um, of imperialism, you know, from at least the 19th century. So we can situate the Cold War in that way in a longer historical arc rather than seeing 1945 as some kind of year zero um, and the Cold War beginning, therefore, after that. So globalizing the Cold War, in other words, um, gets us to rethink the Cold War and in fact actually gets us in some ways to unthink the Cold War um, by seeing its relationship to this other story of imperialism and decolonization as perhaps the, the more significant one in which perhaps um, the Cold War is just a chapter. So that's something for you to think about and, uh, and a kind of um, uh, a way of, of, of thinking about the Cold War that you might not agree with and that also is, is worthy of, of discussion. Okay, so the globalization of the Cold War, that's, that's the first stream that Richardson Little's book clearly connects to. The other stream, this one less, this is an important stream, I want to call our attention to it. Um, but uh, it's less direct in its connection to, to uh, the human rights dictatorship, though we might want to think about those connections ourselves or imagine what they might be. And that is kind of related to what I was saying a minute ago, but that is a kind of a set of scholarship that that sort of again calls into question the Cold War, that puts the Cold War in quotation marks, that that puts a question mark on it, that asks you know you might call it the so-called Cold War and so on. Um, and there's a really important essay on this um, by a historian Matthew Connolly. It's called "Taking Off the Cold War Lens." It's published in the American Historical Review in the year 2000. And he's looking at kind of the U.S. relationship between France during the um, Algerian War of Liberation um, in the 1950s. And what Connolly does is he, you know, with this memorable metaphor, calls the Cold War a lens, a way of seeing, and therefore kind of denaturalizes what it is and makes it kind of a question mark. Um, and this it kind of slowed to gather pace, I would say, but in the in the 20 years since then, um, 21 years since then, I guess, this this idea I think is taking on more traction. Um, so, um, a couple of works I would point to here: um, Masuda Hajimu's Cold War Crucible is a great example of this. So, this is a book that came out in 2015, I think. It's about the uh, the Korean War. It puts the Korean War in an international context, um, but it also very much calls into question the Cold War in doing so. It, it argues, um, Masuda argues that the, that the Cold War sort of came into being, that people needed to be convinced that the Cold War was actually a thing. It wasn't an automatic, it wasn't a given, it was something that came into existence. Maybe we could, we could sit, you know, set up a parallel there with Richardson Little, maybe in terms of like what he's doing for human rights, historicizes and denaturalizes it. So this book, Cold War Crucible, does this for the Cold War as a whole. So we can think about... Sorry, not at the moment. Um, and so we can think about Richardson Little's work in that, um, in that context. Okay, so there's a couple of historiographical streams that the book connects to. Now, let me say a few words about Thomas Fleischmann's um, essay. And in this, in this case, I want to speak again, you know, I want to say something about um, just what a remarkable piece of writing this is. Um, and I want you to think about how you may situate an, an argument you might want to make. Um, think about this as a model for what an argument you might want to make might look like. Okay, so... 
gonna go a different way so as to get off this busy road. It's probably so loud in the camera. Okay, so, um, so, he, so it's called Animal Farms, and so Fleischmann's written this book um, about pigs, communist pigs, about pigs uh, as kind of, you know, in the GDR, and as a way of using, uh, as a way into thinking about um, the connection between environmental history and the history of the Cold War with the GDR example. So this essay in some ways is sort of a, a calling card for that, right? It, it introduces you to some, some, you know, his thinking on this, and it maybe will encourage you to check out his book uh, as well, which is, which is a good idea to do. But just think about this essay in and of itself as a mode of writing, or as a, a, in terms of its writing. So he sets it up with Animal Farm, the very well-known, you know, story bar George Orwell, and he reminds us that the Animal Farm, you know, um, that one of the most kind of pointed parts of Orwell's critique was the convergence between the, the humans and the animals in the story by the end, well, the pigs and the, and the humans by the end of the story. He then situates the book in its, in its kind of context in the emerging Cold War and talks about how, um, and talks about how the, um, the book was taken up and how it was kind of, um, how it was interpreted um, and how it uh, was used in different ways um, to further a kind of um, Cold War logic and, and ideology. And here, what he means is, is a kind of, um, you know, by thinking about communism as totalitarian and thinking about a kind of critique um, of, uh, of communism uh, through this book. So what this does is it, it kind of lets off the hook the, the ways in which we might think about the Western um, uh, component in this. And in fact, even in the kind of cartoon film version um, that was commissioned by the CIA of the book in, I think, 1954, a few years after Orwell's death, that this book, um, I mean this film, they even changed the version at the end um, so as not, so as really to de-emphasize the, the convergence, convergence kind of theme. Um, okay, I'll go this way. So, um, so this sets things up nicely because again, it's a hook, it's a way in, we know something about Orwell, we've probably heard of Animal Farm if we haven't read it, it gets our attention. But then it also, it's, it's perfect because of course he wants to talk about pigs, which are the, you know, which are main characters in, in Animal Farm as a way into thinking about his topic of, of communism and GDR history. But even more to the point, his argument is one about convergence, um, as we also talked about in class. His argument is one that, um, that looks at, um, the ways in which, particularly after some pivotal events um, at the beginning of the 1970s, lead to a situation in which um, the the GDR, um, you know, authorities need to honor their credits um, from from loans made um, from Western countries, and they push the um, the factory farm system to the limit to to do so. This looks actually a lot like. Um, you know, agribusiness and large-scale agriculture in um, in the capitalist West. Okay, I think I'm gonna go here. Okay. So, um, so it's just such a nice parallel, and it's nice to think about a kind of literary example that you could pull on to make your argument. Um, I mean, in this case, it's also ready to hand, kind of like the fall of the Berlin Wall was in the way that um, Richardson Little sets up his argument. But it's nice to, to think about as, as, you know, kind of examples of, of something that you might think of as a way in to setting up your argument. Um, so his argument about convergence in terms of um, these different systems of, of agriculture is just so nicely paralleled by the way that he that he sets it up. So you might want to think about that. Um, in terms of historiography, you know, um, I would say, um, you know, one of the one of the key streams here, of course, is environmental history. And you know, going back to Alfred Crosby's The Columbian Exchange, thinking about kind of commodity and kind of environmental histories of like sugar, say, with Sidney Mintz's uh, Sweetness and Power. I think the Columbian Exchange is from the early 70s, Sweetness and Power. Um, Mintz is actually uh, an anthropologist, but this is very much a, you know, a book that historians read and should. 
um, about sugar and about sugar both as a product uh, being produced under conditions of racial slavery and uh, sugar as a product consumed uh, within the imperial metropoles, particularly in Britain. So, so we could think about, you know, Fleischmann in a longer trajectory of, um, of environmental history here, and of course with many other um, examples. My own field of American studies, William Cronin's work, Nature's Metropolis about, about uh, Chicago um, is an environmental kind of history of the, of the city and its surrounding area um, that comes out in the early 90s. But his earlier book, Changes in the Land, is also, it's about New England. Um, this book is from uh, 1983. And it's about how, you know, the, the invasion of the, of the settlers, um, though he doesn't use that exact terminology, but for shorthand, the invasion of the settlers brings about, you know, property lines and, um, and new ways of, of kind of conceptualizing and organizing the landscape. So it's, so it's a way that environmental history, to use the, the metaphor of the lens, gives us a lens on, you know, a variety of, of different kinds of topics. Um, imperialism, slavery, um, uh, settler colonialism, you know, um, and so on. The Cold War, surprisingly, is not that well developed uh, an area um, for um, environmental history. There's some of it for sure. It's not, it's not unexplored. Um, and our own Frank Utiker is a great example um, of this. He has an essay and a collection on, uh, a, a collection of essays on Cold War environmental history. Um, and he makes some really great points in that. I highly recommend this piece. Um, you know, he looks at the end of the Cold War as a kind of opportunity, um, an opportunity that's not, that's not, you know, taken up, um, as an opportunity to think about, uh, to rethink, um, you know, uh, environmental practices. Um, he doesn't, he doesn't view the Cold War as kind of a cause of, uh, environmental, um, movements, but he looks at it as, as a kind of, you know, a potential shift in the discourse, um, and in ways that Fleischmann's work kind of positions our own environmental um, uh, practices as a warning, you know, thinking about it as parallel to the situation of the GDR, you know, an unsustainable situation um, and the end uh, in which the end, you know, came kind of suddenly, that this also is, is a, potential, um, a potential issue and a potential danger for, um, for the, the contemporary capitalist West as well. And Frank's uh, essay is really an important moment in, in cataloging that as well, that warning, in the way that he thinks about and writes about the end of the Cold War as, again, this opportunity not realized. So that's probably a good place for me to, to leave it um, with that. I hope this has helped develop a few of the ideas from seminar. Um, and, uh, and I hope, particularly again for the distance learning students, that this might be... Um, you know, an interesting way maybe to see a little bit of the city uh, as we go. Okay, thanks everybody. I will see you uh, next time. Bye.